Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Ali Sa. I'm from uh, South Korea, and I'm very sorry that I couldn't make it there in person. It is 4 a.m. in South Korea right now, and I figured this would be a more coherent way to de deliver my talk. Um, today I'm going to be talking about insights from a psychological intervention that we developed in collaboration with Nanit, and it's to help change the way that parents think about their child's sleep so that their child and, and the parent can sleep more and better. And if you are a parent who has ever tried to put their child to sleep, I'm sure that you can appreciate it's a very difficult and complicated process. And a lot of the times, the parent's behavior and the way that the parents think about their child's sleep really has a lot to do with it. And uh, the way we found this out was, you know, I live in South Korea, and there really wasn't a lot of available data in terms of uh, what, uh, how parents were implementing uh, behavioral sleep interventions for infants. Uh, behavioral sleep interventions are usually uh, what we refer to as sleep training, uh, or uh, there's three types of evidence-based uh, sleep training. For example, there's standard extinction, graduated extinction, or camping out. And what we found was that 65% of parents reported hearing about one or more of these uh, behavioral sleep interventions. However, only a fraction of those parents actually went ahead and implemented them. And we looked at the main barriers in implementing these BSIs. We found out that uh, the, some of the reasons were that the parents were worried about the child crying and that the child was in distress or some environmental constraints. Uh, Co-sleeping is very common in Asian countries and not having enough space to sleep separately with their child or uh, just having overall lack of information about BSIs in general. And if you compare this to uh, BSI implement implementation rates in Western cult countries, you find that it's it's almost half of what you would uh, hope to find in uh, compared to Western countries. Uh, so what we wanted to kind of see what were some of the barriers, some of the barriers that we could modify in terms of kind of helping these parents go ahead and uh, implement uh, behavioral sleep interventions. And one of the main reasons that what we found was that uh, a lot of the times these parents were interpreting their child crying as uh, being distressed, and they would worry that the beha that implementing behavioral sleep interventions would negatively affect the child's emotional and behavioral development. However, there's a lot of uh, good literature out there, uh, scientific literature that has found that there's no differences in stress hormones uh, and no long-term consequences. Uh, conversely, we found that uh, implementation of BSIs were actually positively related with uh, outcomes such as postpartum depression. And there weren't any long-term differences in parenting style or attachment style. So what we did was we went ahead and collaborated with Nanit, which is a company uh, you, that uses auto video somnography devices. And what it really does is a non-invasive way of really uh, collecting data uh, of the infant in their natural environment. As you could see here, it's a camera above the bed. And it really, uh, it has been validated. So it's scientifically useful. And it also helps us kind of get a little bit of a more clear picture of what the child sleeps like in their natural environment. So uh, one of the first steps we did was we wanted to see kind of how these parents were interpreting uh, their child's sleep and, and their distress around the child crying uh, during bedtime. And we went ahead and developed a questionnaire called the Pumba Q, uh, which is what uh, some of the things that you, some of the items that you are currently seeing. Uh, we found that uh, the different misperceptions that parents commonly have about their infant sleep could be divided into four categories. So, for example, misbeliefs about sleep is, oh, if I don't always know what my my child. Uh, needs at night, it means I'm a bad parent, or a misbeliefs about how the parents should intervene. So if I don't respond right away when my child cries, it will negatively affect his or her emotional development. Some misbeliefs about feeding or general anxiety about being a parent in general. So like I feel I sleep with my child because I feel anxious. And what we found with these 26 item uh, questionnaires is that uh, individuals who have parents who have higher scores actually uh, reflect higher misperceptions about their infant sleep. And it 
was correlated with uh, how their infant child was sleeping, how long their child was sleeping, and how they were sleeping as well. So what we found was that higher levels of parental misperceptions about baby sleep was associated with uh, baby's objective sleep measured by a nanit. Uh, the highest 30% and the lowest 30% when we compared them, there was definitely a, a significant difference in terms of how long they were sleeping. So the highest 30% uh, were only sleeping 590 minutes, where the lowest 30% uh, were sleeping 623 minutes. And uh, there was more parental insomnia severity associated with higher levels of parental misperception. Um, parents who had higher love, higher scores on the Pumba Q uh, were interven intervening at night many much more times, and they were also less confident about their own parenting. So what we did was this is a current ongoing study that uh, that we're doing in collaboration with Nanit. It's called the Simba study. We kind of had a Disney theme going on there. And we developed an intervention where we were specifically targeting some of these uh, inter interpretations and misperceptions that were really getting in the way of these parents actually going ahead and do it and implementing behavioral sleep interventions. So it was three sessions. Everything was done with Zoom because we know parents have a really hard time finding childcare and actually coming in for real sessions. And um, uh, and we had a, a kind of a, a structured uh, session uh, that we were keeping in track of in terms of really identifying some of the misperceptions that they had specifically about their child's sleep, really trying to restructure some of the thoughts, and then uh, really trying to make, uh, really trying to give them some sleep education about their child as well. So uh, we did this with a, a licensed clinical psych. We are doing it with licensed clinical psychologists. And here are some examples that have come up in terms of some of the examples of cognitive distortions that parents were having about their infant sleep. So for example, we might point out that they're engaging in catastrophic thinking. So if my child doesn't sleep, he'll find behind, fall behind his peers in development or overgeneralization. So taking a specific aspect of a situation and irrationally coming to a general conclusion saying, oh, I can't even get my child to sleep through the night. I'm a terrible parent or should statements. So rigid rules that uh, the parents might have around their child's sleep. Oh, I should sacrifice my own sleep to help my child sleep through the night in order to be a good parent. And a lot of these thoughts were kind of, you know, uh, passed uh, along by their own parents or um, came from uh, kind of modeling from uh, before they had a parent. So it's very interesting to kind of see how these thoughts were formed. So the uh, so we kind of just to give you an example of a case study that we did. This was a mother who was 28 years old, and she had a baby who was 13 months, who was an only child. They were sharing their bed, uh, sharing their room, but slept in separate beds. And she said uh, her daughter wakes up for hours in the middle of the night, won't get go back to sleep unless uh, the mom pat pats her on the back or holds her. And she never puts her child to sleep lying down. She's always holding her and then waits until the child falls asleep and then falls asleep and then puts her down. And the goal of our sessions was to get her daughter to fall back asleep by herself. And some of the thoughts that this mother had was that it was really her fault, 100% her fault that her child was not sleeping well. So, you know, we went through the traditional cognitive behavioral therapy and we pointed out some of the um, cognitive distortions that might be in play there. So, for example, all or nothing thinking or, or should statements and uh, some of the observed behavioral changes, despite not doing any type of behavioral intervention, was that she started putting her child to sleep lying down, felt less guilt about it was less likely to intervene during nighttime awakenings. And uh, she was having her child sleep, uh, multi take multiple naps during the day. And through sleep education, she found that maybe that was unnecessary. So after cognitive restructuring, there were these were some of the thoughts that she came up with. There are many other factors besides things that I'm doing that contribute to how well or how bad my child's sleep is. And uh, at 13 months, my child has the physical ability to self-soothe herself. So I just need to trust the process and give her a chance. So here are some of the preliminary results from our study. This was, uh, we currently have 38 subjects. Uh, this is a randomized, this is a randomized controlled trial. And we have uh, 
they were either randomized to the treatment group or an active control group. Uh, we had parents in their 30s. Most of the children are either are between somewhere between six months and 24 months. And uh, there was kind of an even mix between um, the child's uh, gender, but most of the parents were um, mothers. And uh, as you can see here, so the first uh, graph that you see here is uh, the difference in terms of how their their child misperception, their misperceptions about their child's sleep has changed. So these were changes in the Pumba Q score that we had developed for the intervention. And as you can see here, there was uh, there is looks like there is a little bit more of a difference in the treatment group and the as opposed to the control group. Um, and uh, we didn't really see a lot of differences in terms of uh, the time falling asleep, but we did find a little bit. Uh, and hoping to find more uh, stronger differences in terms of uh, time awake uh, during the middle of the night. So here's some takeaway messages for you. Um, the way that you think about your child's sleep can shape the way that you behave toward putting your child to bed and intervening in the middle of the night, or even interpreting how uh, what your child feels when the child is crying. So even if it's not necessarily intended, the parents may inadvertently act in ways that are interfering with their child's sleep. And ultimately, because the child's not sleeping, the parent is not sleeping, which may result in shorter sleep for the baby, which we definitely don't want. And however, uh, most of the sleep interventions for children that are out there are really focused on changing behaviors. And we really, uh, so for example, sleep routines, cried out, graduated, extinction, uh, they're all, these are all behavioral interventions. And really we haven't looked a lot about on, in terms of how the parents are really in, uh, interpreting uh, some of these, uh, some of the, the child's behavior and the child's sleep. So we felt that this was a really good target for intervention in terms of really uh, getting uh, some of this, the, some of the uh, behavioral sleep in intervention implementation rates up in uh, a place, places like South Korea. And hopefully maternal cognitions will be recognized as a modifi modifiable factor that can serve as a target for intervention in sleep disorders with children in the future. So uh, thank you very much. This is my amazing team. We have a, a tiny lab, a sleep lab in South Korea. And we also had a really wonderful team that uh, was working with us in for our study. Thank you very much for listening. Amazing. Thank you, Ali. I'm very excited that you are um, here to join us, but I just wanted to call out Dr. Sa and her, you know, really amazing work. Um, Ali has been instrumental in supporting parents and encouraging the use of BSIs in South Korea and really helping understand and tackle these cultural barriers around BSI implement implementation. And as you heard, there are really significant misperceptions around infant, infant sleep and behavioral sleep interventions. And Ali is working really hard to change that in South Korea. And I just want to say how amazing I think her work is. And I'm very excited that we get to work together. Um, and so to that point, Ali, I wonder, you know, a lot of our, a lot of the um, the BSIs that, you know, that we commonly talk about are really um, sort of fairly focused on, you know, Western type cultures and I wonder if you think that there are opportunities to change any of our BSIs to be more sort of culturally appropriate. Um, hi everyone, sorry it's very early in the morning. <laughs> I'll try to give a, 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 a very smart sounding uh, answer. To that. Um, so I think it, it it's the, so uh, we've been working on this project for a couple of years and I think you know there's a lot there were a lot of barriers so for example I think co-sleeping was one of them I know that co-sleeping is not that much common in western countries but in places like South Korea we found that it was more of it was the majority of people who were sleeping with their child until they were like you know in sixth grade you know so yep. it's it's very much a problem and so, you know, kind of uh, thinking about co-sleeping as a more, you know, layer term, you know, not that it's like good or bad, but like, you know, when does it we make it bad? So like, you know, really delving into topics like that. And also, um, you know, 
we have we know that there are all these good behavioral sleep interventions, but if no one uses them, it's it's really no use. So, you know, getting some sleep knowledge out there, I think, would be one of the ways to kind of uh, lower those barriers and um, really trying to uh, get people to think about it differently. Like it's not like, oh, I'm abandoning my child to sleep at night. So I think that those will be some some good ways. And what we've really found with our cognitive intervention is that just thinking about it differently kind of gives them a little bit of a push towards, you know, being able to actually implement it, even though we don't actually tell them to do any type of uh, behavioral sleep intervention outright. So I think hopefully that is kind of an uh, an exciting step towards, towards uh, raising those implementation rates. Yes, I, I love that. Um, answer and I just see in the chat um, that uh, that just a call out from uh, from Professor Anders um, just sort of um, reminding us that I feel like we're sort of coming full circle um, when we're really thinking that you know remembering that um, you know Dr. Sade you know was very instrumental in really understanding the importance of you know parental cognitions as well as the work of Dr. Tukotsky and and Dr. Khan as well. So I just wanted to to make that call out here and just say how very grateful I am to have to have all of you here. Um, do any of our panelists have any any questions of Ali or of each other at this point? No? Okay. All righty. So we are getting ready to wrap up. And I just wanted to again say a huge thank you to, you know, all of our panelists for all of their, you know, amazing work that they continue to do. Uh, we feel very, very grateful and privileged to be able to support you in this work and um, and, you know, call you colleagues and friends. So um, here until next year, um, hopefully we will see you all uh, all again, same time next year. Um, continue the great work, everyone. And again, if anyone is interested in collaborating with us or you have research ideas that you would like to discuss with us, we are, you know, very, very open to uh, to taking on new research collaborators. So we're happy to hear and hear from any any and all of you. So thank you so so much for joining, and we will sign off and say goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>